May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> like many people, Amazon delivers to my home a lot these days. This time of year, it's not uncommon for Dursi and I to discover several boxes on the front porch in the morning. But once a month, there is a box on the porch that is especially for the dog. The box always contains two seasonally appropriate toys and some treats for the dog. In November, he received a turkey that squeaks, which is the important thing, and a thing that is supposed to look like cranberry sauce for Thanksgiving dinner. <clears throat> Even though these boxes only come once a month, the dog always recognizes the box. I've sometimes wondered if they soak the cardboard in bacon grease, because I have no idea how he knows what it is. And he goes crazy with anticipation when he sees the box. Before we can do anything else, we have to go back to the kitchen and open the box. It is worth the 20 bucks a month just to see his joy. Today we heard from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. On his second evangelism tour, Paul traveled from Jerusalem to the major cities of his time that were on the perimeter of the Mediterranean. Antioch, Thessalonica, Ephesus, Athens, and of course, Corinth. Years later, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth because it was becoming fractious. Several leaders had emerged within the community and people were beginning to choose sides to follow one leader versus another. It was becoming a political mess. Jane Patterson, who taught scripture at Seminary of the Southwest, said that the crux of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is, quote, the emptying of power for another is the manifestation of Christ-like behavior. The emptying of power for another is the manifestation of Christ-like behavior. It is a theme that, of course, connects to the birth of Christ and Advent. The opening of Paul's letter, which we heard today, is a Christological masterpiece. Paul says, quote, we have received Christ, and in every way we have been enriched in him. We do not lack any spiritual gift as we await the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, end quote. It sounds like a contradictory timeline. We have received Christ, we are in Christ, and we await Christ. Paul is saying that we are, even now, fully in the life of Christ, even though we are here in this messy physical world of ours, we are also in God. We are at once in a world of limitation and odd to see the limitless within the limited. In the moment of incarnation, Christ empties himself, takes on human flesh, and enters our world. He does not come with a crown and scepter. He comes humbly. He takes on the limitation of our world, even though Christ is without limit. The monthly dog toys are not durable enough for a bird dog. In the turkey, the wings are already peeling off. You can see the fuzz coming out of them, like they've been in the oven way too long. And so I had to learn to play hide and seek with the dog, with the toys, so that he wouldn't just destroy them every time they came. Every evening, Dursey goes to the mantle where I store one of his toys during the day. He points at the toy as a bird dog would, and then he whines in a shrill pitch that feels like somewhere, somehow, there is crystal shattering. <clears throat> and then our hide and seek game can begin. It is this activity that he craves when the box arrives. The box itself signifies to Dursey that we will play every evening together. It is a joyful ritual that we both anticipate. The church begins a new year today. Advent 1 is a beginning point. We turn our eyes toward the manger and the gift of life. On this day, 
we light the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope. It is hope that pierces darkness and lights our path toward the manger. And so I wondered, on a day when we celebrate divine hope, how does Paul's message connect with that theme of hope? How do our lives manifest Christ-like behavior now, even as we await the coming of Christ? Every time I have a conversation with people in our congregation, I learn more about who we are. At our last vestry meeting, I learned that one of our members has been involved with a food pantry on the west side of Fort Worth for many years. And of course, another vestry member has been involved with CCA in southwest Fort Worth for a long time. We also have volunteers who participate with Four Saints Food Pantry on the east side of Fort Worth. Through these ministries, we help feed hundreds of families every week. When we pour out our power and our privilege to feed hungry people, we manifest or reveal Christ in this world. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 35. The people we feed do not know whether you and I speak English, whether we find our clothes at Neiman Marcus or Goodwill. They don't know about our sexuality or gender. They don't know the color of our hands. They do not know whether we sing soprano, alto, bass, or tenor, or not at all. What they do know is that they were hungry and we gave them something to eat. They come seeking food but they leave with much more. The bags of food signify something much greater. They point toward the hope that is Christ in our world. In a world of limitations where wants and needs are often not met, we manifest Christ through our work and our gifts. To see ourselves as being in Christ opens our eyes to the limitless God within our limited world. It opens the door for us to be participants with Christ in God's ongoing work in our world. For those who are desperate to catch a glimpse of hope, the flicker of this one candle is powerful. It says, I am not alone. On Saturday evenings, I usually send a copy of my sermon to Tanya Iserer. Tanya uploads the text so that people who are at home watching our service today can read the text while they're listening. And because she is a journalist extraordinaire, she reads the sermon several times, and then she typically titles the sermon for me. Yesterday, she was frustrated that I didn't directly say why I had introduced the metaphor of Dursey's box and his toys. And there are many times when I will choose to leave loose ends in a sermon like that because I believe it allows everyone to knit together the own, their own sermon through the context of their lives. But of course, I had that voice of hers in my head yesterday. And so as the day went on, I kept thinking about the metaphor and what it means to me. Dursey's response to the box was never really about the box itself or even the toys that were in it. Those physical things meant that we would share time together. His excitement is a sign of his desire to be in relationship with me. And as we look to the incarnation of Christ, I wonder if the manger and even the baby within it are physical signs to us of God's enduring desire for relationship with you and me.